Welcome back to the third episode of The Secrets of the Scrolls, an Elder Scrolls Legends podcast. I'm here this week with Justin, and we are going to be talking about all kinds of stuff this week. We have a bunch of arena talk. We're going to go over what we think the top classes are. We're going to go over some of the best cards for each color. We're going to uh, talk about some sleeper cards, evaluate some arena decks. Then we're going to move on to some meta talk. I don't know if you saw this. The new meta snapshot is out by Team Prophecy. And this week, yours truly corrupted it with his data. Is that why Archer fell to Tier 2? We'll have to listen to find out. Uh, we've also got Justin on this week, and I consider him to be the scout expert. Uh, so we'll talk to him. What makes it great? What beats it? Maybe there's a budget version out there? I don't know. I'm going to really press him on this, see if we can find one. And finally, we're going to wrap up with a tournament recap. Uh, there was a big tournament over the weekend. Uh, we'll talk about what went on with that, what are some of the big names coming out of that, and the finals haven't yet happened. So let's get on with the show. Justin, welcome back for a second time. You were the first guest to come back. Thank you very much for having me. I've really been enjoying uh, your podcast. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, how have you been doing on the ladder this week? Uh, you know, I've been doing pretty well. I hit rank one legend a couple days ago. And were you able to hold on to it, or was it just instantly <laughs> dissipate? I was able to hold on to it for about 24 hours, um, Ooh, and then I uh, I tanked a few games and dropped down to rank 4, and now I think I'm back up to rank 3. Not too bad. Um, I am also doing pretty well on the ladder. I think I ended the day yesterday streaming, so I was like 45, and then I mm -hmm. said, alright, I'm done, I'm too tired, and I was like, I'll do one more. Whenever I say I'll do one <laughs> more... I always lose because I'm right. tired, lost that game. And then it was late at night, and I was like, I think I'm going to take my control mage on the ladder in the middle of the night when I'm so tired I can't see anymore. Right. What could go wrong? And I, and I lost that game too. So now I'm like 70. Uh, but <laughs> that's all right. I'll, I'll stream today, and, uh, and I'll climb back up. Um, have, do you do that at all, Justin? Do you get, like, the scout deck is awesome, and you know that, and you play it. But do you, do you kind of just go, like, I'm kind of bored with Scout. I'll, I'll throw Action Mage on the ladder. I do. Um, you know, actually, I reached Legend this season playing Mono Red because I uh, I thought it would be fun, and I thought the meta wasn't really well equipped to handle aggro. So I just built a pile of cheap cards and went face with it. And uh, it was because I had had enough of playing Scout. You know, I'd played it for about a month at that point. Um, so I definitely like to switch it up a little bit. Wow. You, uh, you played Mono Red to Legend? That's... Well, that's pretty interesting. I did, yeah. A real, a real, you know, budget garbage list too. It was not, uh, no, not a single legendary card in it. Oh, not even a blood. Oh, I guess blood dragon wouldn't really fit in an aggro version. No, the only thing that cost more than four was uh, triumphant Yarl. Oh, yeah, you gotta have him. I, mean, I did. He's the I key did. to every list. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, happy to hear that you're doing so well on the ladder. Hopefully. Hopefully I can climb all the way up one of these days. We'll see. I've got my tokens deck. It feels like my tokens deck is really good, but it doesn't feel like it's quite number one. Like, it's missing a bunch of, you know, really good legendaries that would help give it that little bit of edge mm -hmm. that maybe I could win, like, one or two more games that would help me move up. Because when you lose at, like, let's, let's say I'm 55 and I play someone who's ranked two, I'll lose, like, 20 ranks if I lose. Yeah. And when I win, it's, like, three. So, yeah, yeah I definitely. have to win something like 28 games in a row just to get to, like, 20 or something. Well, you've come a long way since the last time I was a guest on here. You, uh, you're you talking about a tokens uh, deck, but you're talking about a budget version and how you just started playing it. And so to see you already up to, like, Legend 45, like you were talking about, it's really impressive. So nice work. Well, well, thank you. I did I did pick up two more Bone Colossus, and I'm running a triple Bone Colossus uh, <laughs> version, which is so fun. I put a video up on YouTube yesterday of a game where I got to play all three of them against a the control mage. It was, it was a lot of fun. I saw that. That was a great video. It was so annoying. It'd be like, Bone Colossus? And he's like, hmm, board wipe. I'm like, okay, okay. Bone Colossus? <laughs> uh, the dude who has a taunt when you kill him, he board wipes. Okay, okay. You got me again. Right. So, so that, was, uh, that was a crazy one. <laughs> all Absolutely. right. Well, let's move on to some arena talk then. Okay. Um, I specifically have brought Justin on because I know Justin is really good at arena, and I am only okay at arena. I mean, for me, I'm a constructed guy that plays arena because I need to play arena to get my packs. I kind of treat it like my chore. And I'm like, Mama, Mama, I finished my arena run. Can I go outside and play some constructed, Mama? You know, that that's kind of how I treat arena. What about you, Justin? Do you 
have a deep love for Arena, or are you just naturally really, really good at it? Um, I will say I like Constructed more, but uh, you know, I've, I've been drafting Magic the Gathering off and on for you know, 10 years at least. So I kind of got used to the format, and I played way more um, Arena and Hearthstone than I did Constructed, uh, where I enjoyed playing that more there. Um, and it's really just one of those things where a lot of experience with the different cards and knowing what the cards are that are out there, I think, increases your uh, success quite a bit. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I play Arena kind of like Constructed. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, I'm even playing around Constructed cards, and then they drop <laughs> craziness on me. I'm like, oh, geez, I forgot that card even existed. How the yeah. heck do I handle this? I wasn't ready at all for this card. That happens to me too. And that, you know, part of that I think is is the appeal of Arena to me. I mean, like I'd I'd like to occasionally lose to cards that I've never seen before. Yeah. I I prefer the opposite. I like to occasionally win with cards I've never seen before. That is a much better feeling, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> uh so let's get into it then. Um, I want to start with what you think are the best classes. I, I did a little bit on Arena last time, and I basically just said I think the best classes are anything with green because green has so many great cards at the common and rare level. Um, I'd like to hear uh, a list from you if you can, and then we can parse it out a little bit more. Um, let's start with your number one class. If you had to win, what would be the number one class you would take in Arena? Absolutely. Uh, if I had, if I could pick any of the ten, I would choose Assassin. That's blue green every time. Blue green every time, huh? It's yep. Interesting. You would say that because um, am I? No, I'm not blue green right now. I often take blue green. Blue green mm -hmm. is the one I take most. It's not my favorite. Uh, my favorite is green purple. Um, okay. The, the reason being that green has all the sort of cheap mid range cards that are really good. Mm -hmm. um, purple has a lot of mid-range cards that are really good, and so many bombs you're bound to hit one. That's my That's theory. true. That's definitely true. So why do you like green-blue best? Uh, you know, I, the reason I prefer green-blue is I think that... Uh, I think blue has some of the most flexible spells in the game. Um, Lightning Bolt, Fire Bolt, uh, Cunning Ally, Ice Storm. These are cards that can go, go in any sort of deck and really help control the board uh, and push the game in the direction you'd like. And then kind of like what you were saying about green creatures, um, some of the most efficiently costed creatures are green, and uh, lethal is a, is a really powerful tool in Arena when you're desperate for ways to remove opposing creatures. So I think together the two offer the ability to play an amazing tempo game. Gotcha. So you're thinking this deck sort of makes it so even if your opponent has a bomb, by the time they get to that spot, um, you've taken such control because of your tempo advantage. Right. I mean, you have the ability to play faster than your opponent or regain control of the board if they happen to have something uh, you know, large and in charge. Okay. So um, what's your second favorite class then? And when I say favorite, remember, I mean you've got 150 gold left. You're free to play. You better do well. Absolutely. Uh, I would. My second... Uh, pick for most powerful or one I want to take the most is Mage. That's blue yellow. Interesting. Okay. I'm. Um, you know, Mage has a lot of the strength Assassin does uh, it, with regards to removal. Except I think that you you could actually give the edge to the Mage class uh, as far as the power level of the removal goes. Um, and this is an example of some of those cards that uh, you don't see a lot um, on the constructed ladder, where you have cards like the Dramora. Uh, he costs five. He comes into play and he executes a creature. Yeah, that card um, uh, is very interesting. Somebody hit me with that in draft. And yeah. I was like, what just happened? Right. <laughs> I mean, the very the first time I saw that card was in draft, and I had never seen it before. And I, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that in these two colors uh, that should give you the ability to really lock down the board as long as you have a handful of them. Um, and, you know, there's also cards like uh, the. Th Four magic, a two-two blue creature that comes into play and does two damage to a creature. There's just so much removal that it's hard to it's hard to draft a bad mage deck. <laughs> you do realize though that you're you're naming like legendaries and epics. Oh, you're you're talking about the ash guy. Uh, yeah, yeah, ash the ash guy. Okay, never mind. He's only a rare. Okay, okay, that's okay. I thought you were talking about no, uh, no. What's his name? Uh, Skywatch Vindicator. Oh, who's no. also awesome. 
Yeah, Skywatch Vindicator is obviously exactly where you want to be if you're in these two colors. Yeah, he's he's great. Um, okay, so uh, basically the thought here is that you have really efficient removal, um, mm. and that's how you're you're getting your board advantage. Yeah, I feel like you can win an arena game with you know a one-one creature given enough removal in hand, right? Mm. All it takes is the uh, you know an amount of time to win the game, and it can you can win it with anything. But if you can't control what your opponent's doing, you're going to lose no matter what you have on the board. So I feel like uh, you know a good defense is uh, the best offense in arena a lot of the time, and blue yellow offers that. Okay, that, that's fair. Um, what would be your third class then that you take? Um, the third one I would look at, and I think the kind of locks up a, a trio of. The my go-to choices in arena is battle mage red blue, okay, and just like how I think assassin offers uh, the strongest potential for tempo, and mage offers the strongest potential for control or uh, just general removal, I think battle mage offers the highest potential for a successful aggro deck. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it does. I have been blitzed down by many cards I've never seen before from a red mm -hmm. deck. Yeah, you, you know, a lot. Of, most of the time when we see red on ladder right now, we're looking at the uh, mid ranger control cards that are in the uh, archer decks, and it's easy to forget that this is the color of Steel Scimitar, Fiery Imp, uh, Orc Clan Captain. Just a lot of really powerful aggressive cards. And when you combine them with blue cards to remove creatures or blue equipment, you're looking at a really Streamlined aggressive strategy. Yeah, I, I could understand. So would you say those are equally your top three or somewhat equally, or is um, uh, the Assassin well above the other two? I think Assassin is significantly easier to go 7-0 with than any other class, but I think Mage and Battle Mage are closer to Assassin than they are to anything else. Okay. Let's talk about those three real quick then. Um, you already hit on a couple cards. Let's talk a little bit more uh, with some more depth about some specific cards that you really are looking for. Let's start with the Assassin deck. So you talked about spells generally. Um, so we're looking at Firebolt, Lightning Bolt. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other cards that uh, really jump out at you as like, you got to pick this if it's available? Um, I think anytime you're looking at green, you're going to want to pick up Fighter's Guild Recruits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean that's a, a, a an awesome rip off prophecy, and is going to trade with anything that your opponent has. It doesn't have ward. In in addition to that, anytime you're playing constructed, you want to uh, play <laughs> this guy as well. <laughs> I agree. It's just a really solid card. Uh, it's hard to go wrong with that guy. Yeah, and he's a common, so you're almost assuredly going to see one. If I ever draft green and I don't get one, I'm practically raging. Like, what happened? This guy's a right. common. Yeah, I think colors are really, in Arena, defined by their common and, to a lesser extent, rare cards. And as a common, this is first pickable. Yeah, I agree with that. Along with that, I would say that the uh, the Charis Reaper, the 7 magic of 5-4 that gives all opposing creatures in the lane that's played into minus 1, minus 1, is another common that really helps define uh, the color green. And while it's not uh, a great tempo card, it is powerful enough that I would pick it up unless it wrecked my curve almost every single time. That's interesting, because maybe that's one of the reasons I don't have quite as much success, is I pass on this card a lot. I look at it and I say, it's 7 cost, so it's pretty darn bomby late game, and mm -hmm. its stats are pretty bad for a bomb, so I'm going to have to get insane value out of that minus 1, minus 1, and in Constructed, I can build a deck that does that. In right. Draft... I'm just hoping my opponent allows this card to wreck their face. And so <laughs> I tend to draft that less. So you found that that card has been really effective for you? I've had a lot of success with picking up that card. I mean, you don't want to pick up like four or five of them, you know. <laughs> yeah, that would be madness. <laughs> right. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's not terribly difficult to leverage that card's power into at least a two-for-one trade. Sure. I can see that. Um, and I've... I've come around to picking it more often now. Um, like, I'll pick it if if I don't have a lot of late game cards, I'll pick it. And with green, you often don't, unless you're paired with something like purple. Right. Okay, well, that's a, that's a good tip. A any other cards like that that maybe somebody would undervalue, such as myself? <laughs> um, 
You know, it, uh, in blue, it's there are a lot more more powerful, obviously powerful cards, but there are a few that I think are kind of easy to underappreciate. I generally am not a fan of the give all your creatures a keyword card, uh, or or a fan of the if you have more health than your opponent, do something cards. Mm -hmm. But I think Royal Sage is kind of an easy pick um, in Arena, right? Even if you're not ahead on life, you're getting a four Magicka four four, which is yeah. totally playable in Arena. And in the event that you are ahead in life, it means you got creatures on the board more than likely because you got there. And uh, you know, giving them all a random keyword can be really swingy in arena, in particular, where there are a lot fewer answers to what you're doing. Yeah, I agree. She is the card where I way undervalued her, um, mm -hmm. and then I was playing a draft and I kind of got stuck with her. And yeah. I, I was like, oh my god, <laughs> this yeah. card is ridiculous. Like. Keywords in draft are insane. Absolutely. Yeah, and like if you can curve her with something stupid like Brutal Ashlander into Soul Split into Cunning Ally into right. Royal Sage and get four keywords, you might have just won the game. Absolutely. And it's worth pointing out, you mentioned Brutal Ashlander. I mean, that's a pretty obvious, uh, reasonable pick in Arena. But uh, if you get... Brutal Ashlander to have Drain or Lethal via <laughs> Royal Sage, yeah. that last gasp trigger is going to either gain you life or just kill anything it touches. Oh, wow, I didn't think about that. A lethal on him would be amazing. You kill the guy you hit, and yeah. then you do three damage to something else and kill that. Yeah. Oh, oh, that that's a combo that I want to see. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds that sounds very exciting. The the one other card in blue that I think uh, might get um, overlooked a little bit is Crown Quartermaster. That's the one Magicka 2-1 summon, draw a plus one, plus zero steel dagger. Pretty simple little guy, or um, little lady, I suppose. But it, uh, it, it offers you a whole bunch of flexibility. It trades well in the early game. And the plus one, plus zero steel dagger is just a great way to make, to trade up your smaller minions into larger things. Yeah. This is another card where I've never been quite sure of whether I should get here. I, I want to ask you about a card that, um, uh, and by the way, uh, Between the Lanes has a tier list available for anyone who is sort of new and you don't know the cards very well, and I'll put that in the show notes. Um, it's a great place to start. I wouldn't end there, um, but it's a, it's a great starting spot. But they have the Varanus Courier, the gal with the rash on her sword hand. Um, they have her listed really low, and in Constructed, she's great. It's a, it's a guard withdraw what do you think she's very unimpactful for a three drop in draft so I'll, i've been torn myself as to what exactly her value is that's a good question you know when we were talking about underrated cards and i was looking at green cards i thought about her uh, um i do like her a whole lot in constructed but uh i have to kind of agree that it is not the greatest arena pick i can certainly see situations where it's amazing and strategies that it would fill a great niche in but I don't think I would go out of my way to pick these guys up in Arena. Yeah. I think what makes her so strong and constructed is you get to pair her with as many Leaf Lurkers and Finish Offs as you want. So you're getting like a trigger for your Finish Off, which gives you a card which replaces the Finish Off that you're playing because you're drawing a card. And so there's so much constructed synergy with her that in Draft, it's just kind of like, well, I'm going to do a damage to a guy that might do very little and then get a card, but I've lost a lot of tempo because I played a three drop. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good point. What about um, the Sean Avenger? I consider her just to be so great in Constructed, mm -hmm. and I think she's a fantastic in Arena as well. She's really hard to handle. I agree. I think it's a lot of value, you know. Um, it's uh, 12, uh, 12 power toughness total uh, for four Magicka, which is a great deal. Wait, 12? Um, what? Right, six the first time, six the second time. No, no, no. She's a she's a three three. Right, right. It's three plus three plus three. Oh, plus you're three. saying total? Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes, my mistake. It has been a <laughs> long time since I did any math, though, so I could be. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I could be screwing you, that up. You've got it. I was just simply confused. <laughs> um, she's a great deal. Uh, you know, it's it's worth pointing out though that uh, if you can manipulate the board to a state that is favorable to you, you can frequently get a better deal off of Haunting Spirit, the purple 3-3 mm. three, three that has last gasp, give a random friendly creature plus 3 plus 3. Yeah, that card's really good. 
Yeah, that's another solid choice in Arena. Um, last card I want to ask you about is um, the Murkwater Savage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's say, let's say it's kind of early, and he's available to you. You have no idea if you're going to get a lot of green cards. You just take right. him, though, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, a 2-2 two, two for 2 is not bad. You know, you're going to want those 2 drops and uh, to, you know, remain on a competitive in the early game. And the potential for this thing to turn into a 10-10 and then take over the game is, you know, it's there. It's not unreasonable to see that happen. Yeah, I, I took him recently. I actually took a couple of him recently and had almost <laughs> no green cards. It didn't yeah. matter. Right. <laughs> if you have one green card in your hand, you're fine. I had a, I had like a turn or two turns in a row that I couldn't play any green cards, but I still was able to end up growing him because I think my opponent was kind of like, oh, this dude, it's draft. He's light on green. I don't have to worry mm -hmm. about him that much. He put down this other bigger threat, and then, you know, mid-game, suddenly I drop like two on a turn. He's like, wait, oh, yeah, that Savage can grow. Oh, yeah. no. So it was a very I interesting game. Murkwater Savage is a must-kill target. You know, I mean, you don't... Any of these kind of grow-out-of-control cards need to be dealt with as, you know, at the point where you can still deal with them. Right. Um, what do you think about finish off in draft? In Constructed, it has infinite value. Yeah. Uh, I feel like it has less value in draft, but it's still really strong. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly harder to synergize with it, right? Like, you're not going to be drafting a whole slew of deal one damage to an opposing creature effects necessarily in Arena. But creatures are going to get damaged because Arena is largely a fight for tempo on the board. So finish off is always going to, well, almost always going to have value and have a target. Maybe not going to, it may not be the target you want that turn, but it, you should be able to get some value out of it all the time. All right. So let's say you're building your assassin deck. Yeah. Um, what are the five cards that if you had these five cards, you would say, bam, I think this is going to be a pretty darn good assassin deck? Uh, well... I think Fighters Guild Recruits, a must include there. All right. I'd like to see a Ward Crafter. I think that's a really solid card that lets you make mm -hmm. very favorable trades. Interesting. I'm not sure I would have put that in my top five, so that, that's a very interesting include for me. It's a great card. Um, I think Lightning Bolt's essential to any deck running blue uh, for the flexibility it offers both as removal and as a finisher. Okay. Prophecy's not bad either. Absolutely. I mean, it's one of the strongest prophecy cards, I think. Oh, oh, you have lethal? No, right. you don't. That's exactly. hilarious. <laughs> I really like the flexibility offered by Dune Smuggler. I think switching oh. cards between lanes is a great way to retain uh, tempo in the game, especially in the assassin colors, which are the colors that you're probably going to be playing for tempo the most. So I think Dune Smuggler is one that I definitely want to grab. I love Dune Smuggler, and Justin, I think you and I need to get together and make a Dune Smuggler constructed deck. I think that it is well within our ability to do that. All right. That, stay tuned for a later mm -hmm. episode. The Dune Smuggler constructed episode. And since we're in Magical Fantasy Land, I'm going to go ahead and say Queen Baron Zia. The, uh... <laughs> what? I don't even know this card. Right? It's the green-blue unique legendary creature. It's a 6-3 with Drain. It's got some other text, but like, let's just what? stop and appreciate the fact that it's a 6-3 with Drain. Oh, man. This is the kind of card that is going to uh, yeah. dominate an arena game. I'm, I mean, if I'm it's starting, not dealt with immediately. I'm starting to see why you win a lot of arena games if um, if you're like, yeah, you know, seriously, you should be taking Queen Barnzea. I mean, she's good. Take her. <laughs> <laughs> if you're seeing her regularly... You gotta leg up on the rest of us, Justin. Absolutely. I didn't want to go out of my way to point out legendary cards because, I mean, they're all great. You know, Ungulum is great in Arena, but I would love to draft a Queen Burnsea. All right, that's fair. Uh, so you said your your second favorite deck was Battle Mage. Or, sorry, uh, Mage. Yeah. Uh, green, uh, Blue, yellow. So name me the five cards uh, in that faction that you're thinking, I got these five, boom, I am on my way. This may be a 7-0. Sure. I mean, there is the overlap of blue, but it's actually mostly a different list of cards. <clears throat> I would take uh, Piercing Javelin. Oh, yeah. I think that's the most impactful prophecy card you can have, as well as just, you know, unrestricted removal in Arena is fantastic. I played yesterday, uh, I believe, three turns in a row. I popped the runes. All three times that Piercing Javelin came off the top and you killed my guy. That is awful. I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. Man. Yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> I didn't oh, win man. that game, actually. <clears throat> 
Um, I would take. Uh, I love Raj Heaney Highway, Highwayman, the two two for three yellow creature with pilfer draw card. It's a lot harder to answer in arena. Oh. One one hit with this, you're uh, you're looking good. Wait, how, how much does this guy cost? He costs three or two. Three for a two two. We got to stop on this one a second. Wow, you seriously listen to that guy in your top five? This shows you how little I know about draft. I usually don't even take this guy. Um, I you know here's the thing like. Blue yellow have a lot of ways to clear out a way for this this guy to attack. Hmm. So I feel pretty comfortable taking one. I wouldn't want to take more than one necessarily. I mean, I'll pick up two and not be unhappy about it. But sure, it's got such a high uh, threshold. Like I'm sorry, a high level of potential impact that it's hard for me not to love that card. Yeah, I mean, I love draw. You put the word draw a card on any card, I automatically hmm. think it's at least decent. Absolutely. That's very interesting. Okay. What my else next, are we looking for? My next spot would be a, a kind of a tie between Aerostorm and Execute. I think uh, they're both super good at uh, controlling the board for you in the early game and getting you to the point where you're dominating the board. And, um, you know, in Arena, I don't mind spending three Magicka on an Aerostorm to kill one creature. Um, but if, uh, if I get more than one, that's just fantastic. Okay, and that's fair. And like, like you're saying, in, in arena, you, we don't have quite as much control over our deck, and they may play low strength guys in the mid game, and maybe they have a pilfer and grow, or maybe they have some other effect, and they're they're worth just removing anyway. Exactly. Okay. What else? One more. One more. Uh, this is kind of a tough pick. You know, I'm not leaning towards any of the blue cards here. I think of blue as sort of the support color when I'm playing in these two colors. Okay. Um, so but with, I am, with that in mind, you basically mean like whatever removal you get is great. You just want something from blue that's removal. Right, exactly. Gotcha. Um, but I'm going to go with, and, and this is a testimony to how powerful the two-color cards are. I'm going to go with Skywatch Vindicator. You know, it's an epic, but 4-4 uh, four, four for 6 that uh, has that sort of flexibility can uh, really yeah. make or break a game, you know, just swing in one turn your, your way. i got to say, I'm hoping in future card pools, they have more cards like this with this kind of flexi <coughs> flexibility at a lower cost point. Yeah, Even definitely. if it's something like three cost, two, two, deal one damage, or give plus one, plus one. I just love this idea of I can do multiple things with this card. It becomes this major tool in my toolbox. Yeah, definitely. I agree. All right. So that's our second one. Um, third best uh, faction, according to Justin, is Battle Mage, red, blue. So, so Justin... What are we looking for in red blue? In red blue, we are looking to go face. So we're looking <laughs> for cheap creatures um, that trade well if uh, you know if you need to. Although that's secondary to just doing a lot of damage to your opponent. And we're looking for equipment to uh, throw on either charge creatures or creatures that we have put in the shadow lane the previous turn. Okay, let me stop you for a second. Are you talking like you see equipment, you take it, or is there certain equipment where you go, no, that's just. That's too expensive, and when I get two for one, it's going to be too much. Or are you just thinking, equipment's good, I'm going face, it's going to be fine? Um, there's definitely some that are a lot better than others. That's a really good uh, good point, because you're not going to want to pick up necessarily, um, unlike in Constructed, where this card isn't terrible. Uh, like, Bone Bow is kind of unimpressive in Arena. Um Clearing out opposing guard creatures is important, so it's not necessarily bad, but uh, you're looking mostly for cards like Steel Scimitar, a one Magicka plus two plus two. Let me stop you for just a second, because I drafted Bone Bow in my last deck. Yeah. <laughs> like, I want to talk about this last deck that I drafted with you real quick. Sure, It didn't yeah. do very well, because I think it's going to fit into this. So I drafted Bone Bow, mm -hmm. um, and I also took the four-cost one. It was like... Make them, uh, what is it, the Heavy Battle Axe, plus four, plus one. And when I took these, I knew these are lower impact weapons, but I had a whole bunch of guys that said, if they have a weapon, do this. And so I right. thought, <coughs> I really need some sort of weapon for these guys. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Was that, a, was that an error or not? Uh, you know, I wouldn't mind having one Heavy Battle Axe in my, uh, in my Battle Mage list, and I wouldn't mind having... Orcish Warhammer for sure, which I think is uh, stronger than Heavy Battle Axe. But 
I think it's more important to draft cards that are individually powerful than it is to look yeah. for synergistic effects because you can rely on a card's power as printed every time, whereas you know if these conditions are met, isn't something you're going to be able to meet all the time. Yeah, what happened is I got pretty late and I didn't have any weapons yet. I didn't see a Skimitar and I was just like, yeah. oh my goodness, I have four guys that have major buffs when weaponed. Right. I'm desperate. I gotta take some weapon and and not shockingly, it did not go well. Yeah, I, I've certainly found myself in that position before where I pick up an improvised weapon, you know, the, the Zero Magicka plus one plus one and breakthrough equipment, uh -huh. just because I'm sitting on three uh, Rehod Horsemen or something like that. Um, okay. It's not the worst thing that can happen to your draft, but I think it's more important, you know, if there's a creature in that slot, yeah. uh, to grab that guy. Okay, so let, let's go back to your top five. So you would put Steel Schematar in there? Absolutely, I would pick that. I mean, anytime I'm playing red, I'm going to pick that, but I think it's most useful in the uh, Battle Mage deck. Yeah. Basically, for me, if a weapon is cheap and adds health to them, it goes, its value is super high in any deck, whether it be mid-range, aggression, just being able to give my guys health buffs, it lets you trade easier, lets you go face easier, lets them live longer. It's just such a great weapon. Yeah, I totally agree. Um you know, along with uh, what we were just talking about, though, with the weapon synergy, I'm going to go ahead and, and pick Rehod Battle Mage, the three magic of three three. It gets plus zero, plus three in guard when equipped with an item. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm doing that because a three three for three is playable on its own. Yep. And uh, if you do throw that uh, scimitar on it, for instance, you're looking at an enormous creature <laughs> very early in yeah, the game. Yeah, a five eight with guard on turn three or four. That seems right. good. <laughs> yeah. So I would pick that guy up pretty highly in this. Uh, in okay. this color combination. Um, I'm going to grab one epic here. I think Burn and Pillage is mm. an absolute beast of a card in uh, aggressive arena decks. What's the cost That's on six Magicka. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, deals one damage to all enemy creatures for each uh, destroyed enemy rune. Ah, yes. I this don't even makes... own this card, by the way. Don't even own it. I mean, its constructed applications are sort of limited right now. Yeah. But uh, in Arena, I, I think it might even be the most powerful card you can draft in Arena. Um, one of the reasons why I think it's so awesome in Arena is because it's not played in Constructed. And whenever it's played on me, I'm like, oh my goodness. Right. All my guys are dead? <laughs> like, I forgot yeah. Red had that kind of board wipe at their disposal. I mean, it's... I, I it wins games, right? Like there's no way to no other way around it. Yeah, I got severely wrecked by it. I think maybe twice now. Mm -hmm. uh, what about Triumphant Yarl? Do you think he's as good? Well, I mean, he's obviously not as good in arena, but is he a card that you're desperately trying to get in your arena decks? Um, in this color combination, I'd be more inclined to get it than in many others. But I can see situations where I'm not picking it up. You know, if I have a, a more aggressive creature to choose from in that spot. I think it's kind of a poor choice not to pick it up as a general rule, mm. but it's not a must pick for me, I don't think. Gotcha. So who are these aggressive creatures then that you're picking over, you know, the meta defining triumphant Jarl? Sure. Um, this is a deck where Brutal Ashlander is going to shine. Mm, okay. Uh, this is a deck that could get quite a bit of mileage out of Fiery Imp, although, I mean, it's an awful top deck. Uh, Fiery Imp, the 1-1... One, one Red creature for one that uh, deals two to your opponent when it attacks is just a lot of face damage in a very small uh, right. at a very small cost. And I think this is a good point to talk about um, any sort of arena tier list. Fiery Imp is bad in a lot oh, yeah. of arena decks, and thus Absolutely. put very low on any arena tier list. But if you're doing a face deck, he becomes infinitely better. Yeah, absolutely. You know. The, the safer picks are cards like Orc Clan Captain, the 2-2, two, two, Magicka 2-2, two, two, Red Card that gives other friendly creatures in the lane plus 1, plus 0. Yep. This can be used reactively to help you make a, to help your smaller creatures trade up or to push that face damage you're looking for. Sure. Okay. Um, all right, so those are uh, Justin's top three. Real quick, how, how, how about we round out our top five? Um, what would be the next two classes you would take? So these are substantially lower than the three you just mentioned, right? Sure, yeah. Uh, my, my next two would be Spell Sword. That's uh, the token colors, you know, yellow and purple. Okay. And uh, Scout. That's uh, purple and uh, green. Purple and green, okay. Yes, the deck I always go for got mm -hmm. fifth 
on Justin's tier list. <laughs> you know, it's my number one constructed choice, so okay, it's got okay. that going well, for that's it. That's fine. Um, since we haven't mentioned purple yet, just generally speaking, what do you consider to be, say, the three cards you really want in purple and what is like a sleeper card in purple that, that a lot of people might not know about? Okay. Um, I think the best aggressive creature in purple is Dragon Tail Savior, the two magic of two, three that gets plus one, plus zero for each enemy creature in this lane. It's pretty easy to just look at this as a two magic of three, three, which is, you know, above curve. Mm hmm. So that's one you're uh, definitely always going to want to be interested in. As far as picks for sleeper cards go, uh, there's one that I've, I've had a lot of success with lately, and that is Lion Guard Strategist. What? <laughs> What's yeah, Lion exactly. Cards? I didn't know this was a card for a long time. What? How much but does it a, cost? I've never heard of this card. It's a 4 Magicka 2-3, right? And it says, when you summon <laughs> another creature in this lane, give it ward. Oh, this guy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's pretty uh, cool. It's not unrealistic to uh, get a lot of value out of this guy, right? I mean, you kind of have to, like, plan for it because it it needs to go in the shadow lane more than likely because it, it's going to just get attacked and killed instantly otherwise. Right. But uh, there's a huge potential here for a lot of power. Sure. So that's kind of a sleeper card in these colors. Um, Young Mammoth, I think, is a really solid pick. Uh, I love Young Mammoth. Yeah. I play him in Constructed now. I put him in my Spell Sword deck. He's just too good. I totally agree. I mean, it's one of the most uh, under-costed, you know, cards in the game, to be honest, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, as a rare, you can expect to see it relatively frequently when you're playing purple in Arena. Yep. I, I'd say this card is one of the reasons why I like purple. It's just such a strong three-drop that people have a hard time dealing with it. And then, um, what do you think about one of my favorite four-drops in draft, which is the um, Scrapper? The Stone Two Scrap or the Four Five. I was just coming to this next. This is a. I mean, this is this is a great card. This is our Yeti, right? Yeah. Um, I th I think it's a really really solid four drop. I think that any deck running purple can benefit from having one of these guys because it's really hard to imagine situations where you're not getting some really great trades against the things your opponent did in, uh, during turns one through three. Yeah, that that's kind of why I like purple so much is because you get stuff like the Mammoth and the scrapper and then you just get to hopefully you'll get one of the bombs right there's so many of them between yeah. bone colossus naga live blood magic lord swamp mm. leviathan iron atronach night yeah. town lord they are all good in draft you get any one of those and you're like yes all right we're covering into this bad boy right and it's worth pointing out swamp leviathan's like you know a common card like yeah. it you're probably going to end up with one if you're looking for one yeah and, you can't uh, find a, a better bomb Magica. he's like your backup bomb Right. I mean, I was ramping into Swamp Leviathan and Constructed when the reset happened, so... <laughs> I wish I was playing that week, because yeah. I was doing that too, but you guys were well ahead of me. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, man. All right, well, before we leave our draft roundup here, uh, what are some sort of general tips you can give people? Maybe give us three, three sort of obvious tips, and then maybe three of your, like, secret tips that maybe someone wouldn't know. Okay, um... Well, I think a sort of an obvious one to people who've done it, who have drafted a while, but may not may not be quite so obvious for people who haven't, is that removal, drafting good removal, is really important in arena. Um, an overcosted piece of removal is uh, absolutely fine to run in arena because it's sort of unrealistic to think that you'll be curving out every turn, and having the ability to remove a creature that otherwise is going to wreck you is more important in a lot of cases than having a mediocre creature of your own. Gotcha. So I think, you know, prioritize removal would be my first piece of advice. Would you prioritize it even over bombs? Mm, you know, if I have a solid curve of average creatures and I uh, don't have any removal, then I might, yeah. I mean, it sort okay. of depends on where my draft's at at that time. But, gotcha. Um. Because, you know, it's important to keep in mind that that bomb I draft, if my opponent drafted more removal than I did, is just going to get destroyed. Okay, that's fair. Another thing that I think is uh, just worth pointing out is that uh, the, the drain keyword is a little <laughs> bit more useful in Arena than uh, oh. it is in Constructed. And it's, it's the not... worst, is what it right. is. It's the worst, Justin. You know, because these Constructed decks can... Uh, can be built in a way that 
they accelerate into a point where it's not like they can only do 30 damage, right? Yeah, They're going to end up doing 60, 90, as much damage as they need to do. And Arena deck might struggle some games to deal 30 damage. And so if you gain 20 life, uh, you have a large enough cushion that, you know, I wouldn't go out of your way to draft cards with Drain because I think that it's the weakest uh, weakest keyword you could look for in a creature most of the time. But it's worth pointing out that it's a pretty good idea to uh, pick them up if you have the opportunity. Okay. Yep, I would agree with that. And I, I think most people might not realize how good Drain is in draft, but it, it is it can be really not just good, but soul crushing. Yeah. Like your opponent drops like the, the big the big bomb with lots of drain and you're just like, mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a removal in my hand. That's game. Like there's right. there's no way I'm gonna deal with this guy. He's gonna gain sixteen health before I can kill him. That's that's it. There's no way I can overcome that. Um, the other thing I would mention is that Pilfer creatures are much stronger in draft than they are in constructed. Uh, where you can not, where in a, in a format where your opponent's not necessarily going to have an answer to your creature every turn, or a guard to throw down in front of it, um, pilfer cards can get out of control very quickly. Um, I wouldn't ordinarily play most of the pilfer cards, but uh, you know even Daring Cutpress, the two magic a two two, it can get really big fairly quickly in a format where your opponent can't answer it. Yeah, I've, I've had several. I usually take that card pretty highly, and so I had one yeah. draft where I had, I think, five of them. <laughs> and uh, I went, I got seven wins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it was just, it wasn't that one of them was so good. It was that my opponent would do whatever it took to kill one. They would do whatever it took to kill the second one. And by the time the third one hit, they were like, well, that, you've already exhausted all of my options to kill a dude before he grows out of control. So, mm -hmm. well done, sir, with your lucky draft. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, that that was great. I, th I think that's some really useful um, draft tips. Uh, I think now we should move on to uh, some meta talk. But before we do, I did want to announce that I have my Patreon page going for this podcast. So if you want to support the podcast, um, come on over to the Patreon page. Uh, we do have uh, one person right now who is already signed up, uh, so I'd like to thank them. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I had their name here in front of me, and now I have forgotten it because I'm tired. It is Grand Patron. So there you go. This person probably patronizes lots of people with his name. Uh, <laughs> so come on over, check out the different tiers. Whatever tier you do, uh, the first time you do sign up, I'll go ahead and announce you on the stream because uh, stuff like this really helps us... Uh, keep going and pushing forward and uh so that is great and quite useful so thanks so much to grand patreon and hopefully someone else um comes along and uh also justin uh, i like to read five star reviews on uh, itunes uh for people okay. because it's very helpful for others to be able to find the podcast if there's five star reviews it sort of pushes up the podcast on people's feeds um so we did get one five-star review. So, Justin, you, you ready right. to hear this? Yeah, and congratulations, too. Oh, thank you. This person does seem to like the, the show, so here we go. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Sandra M. Saucedo writes, I'm really enjoying this podcast. The host is enthusiastic and interesting, and the guest was fun as well. And you know what, Justin? I'm pretty sure that was you. So, oh, well I'm glad done, to hear Sarah. it. I just yeah. got into the game and found a lot of the advice here really useful. Looking forward to more. Well, Sandra... Here's another one. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for uh, liking the show, dropping us a review. And uh, it's time now to move on to what, what to me is even more interesting than Arena. Meta talk. I agree. All right. So if you haven't noticed, uh, there is a new meta report out by uh, Team Prophecy, which actually both Justin and I are a part of. Uh, so we actually helped build this meta report that's put out by Fade. Um, and there looks to be a new top dog, Justin. Do you agree with this, that the tier <laughs> list is different this week? Things have definitely changed since uh, the last time one of these came out, and Archer was all over the place for sure. So I have to ask you this. If, if Archer is tier 2, I have to assume either Marshall or Jarl was nerfed and I missed it? What happened here? 
That would be my uh, <laughs> assumption too if I hadn't been playing because I'm kind of shocked they made it through the week unscathed. But no, what happened was is even though the game is you know in its infancy sort of just being uh, in open beta for a couple weeks now, uh, the meta really responded and matured very quickly to the uh, oppressive um, dominance of the Archer deck by promoting some decks that play really strongly against Archer. Yeah, I agree. So uh, this list has um, Scout Ramp and Spell Sword Token as the Tier 1 decks. Would you agree with that, or is there something else you would put in there or pull out of that? Um, I agree that both those are great, um, partially because of their matchup against Archer, but also because they've got pretty good matchups against most of the field. I think I might also consider uh, Control Mage to be a Tier 1 deck, but I think there isn't really a refined list out there yet that people can uh, jump to. Yeah, Control Mage is interesting because I have a Control Mage list, and mm -hmm. I'm not missing that many pieces, but I am missing a couple. And so I can't yeah. tell if it's my list that's missing a couple necessary pieces, if it's me just not being quite good enough with the list, or if Control Mage just isn't situated as well as I would like it to be. But I win, I don't know, like 65% of my games, which sounds great, but it's yeah. terrible on the ladder for climbing. That actually loses <laughs> you ranks. Right. So, I mean, you got to be like 90% if you want to climb this ladder. Yeah. And I just can't quite hit that win rate. It's actually my favorite deck by far. I love Control Mage. I love just sitting there and going, yeah, uh-huh, bring it on. What you got? Oh, that? That's dead. Oh, that? Um, I'm going to wait on that one. Oh, no, that one's dead. It's just, it's a really fun reactive deck and then you can put down threats like cunning ally and they're like uh what do i do do i trade that do i just go face i don't really know how i'm supposed to handle this right um and then the late game threats are super fun they're like i'll manticora that i'll steal that guy mm -hmm. um and i just i really enjoy decks that play like that it's, it's more my play style i just can't quite hit that you know 80 90 percent win rate with the deck yet you know, I'm in the same position with you. I've uh, I've given some goes. I'm a huge fan of Action Mage, the Tempo Mage, for uh, <clears throat> you know variety of the color combination. Um, but I haven't been able to translate my success with that into success with Control Mage yet either. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, all right, so let's talk about what you had the most success with, and that's the the Scout deck. And we we have taken to putting a dollar sign in in front of the S. Since it's <laughs> so dang expensive. Um, yeah. And, and I consider you to be the scout expert. I mean, you're the guy that put it online, uh, that really has refined the list. I haven't even seen anyone deviate from your list, to be honest. It seems to be the list. Actually, that's not true. People deviate all the time because they can't afford your list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but do you consider it to be the best deck? Like, if you were going into a tournament and you could only, and it was a one game tournament with one deck, would you bring your scout deck? Uh, in that situation, I personally would bring my scout deck, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about this deck then. Um, what makes it so good? Uh, so I think part of the reason I've had so much success with the scout ramp deck, and also I should point out that this week uh, a couple of big streamers um, in the Elder Scrolls Legends community have streamed playing it, including, I believe, Delude and uh, IMCVH and Dovahkiin. Not me, by and, the um, way, because I can't afford the list yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I think part of what lends it to its success on the ladder is its flexibility. Um, mm. As a ramp deck, it has a bunch of smaller creatures to get you to the point of the game where you're playing the enormous creatures, and it gives you the ability to play aggressively against slower decks and to play control against faster decks. Um, this gives a, a person who is familiar with the meta the ability to kind of know which direction to go pretty early in the game when you need to make this sort of pivot. And combined with the flexible nature of the individual cards like Shadowfen Priest, which can silence anything or destroy a support card, or the uh, lethal creatures, which can you know, favorably trade with anything on the board, you're looking at a whole lot of flexibility, which rewards players who are cognizant of the potential things that could happen to them. Yeah, I agree. I really like any deck that rewards you for understanding the meta well and knowing the card pool, knowing what's coming your way. And uh, I think you're definitely right. Everything you said there, being able to have 
ways to can combat every deck. So for instance, I play the spell store spell sword token deck because it's the mm -hmm. one deck I can afford and play at like a ninety percent win rate. And the right. Shadowfen Priest wrecks its face. Yeah. Like I can't I don't just play Divine Fervor when I, I get it. I don't just go like, oh, Divine Fervor autoplay. I have to be like, all right, I'm gonna set up the board. Now I'm gonna play Divine Fervor knowing it gets one use. It's basically a spell. Give everyone plus one plus one. And then it goes away, and my opponent <laughs> gets a body. Like, right. it's just destructive as all can be. And it feels like you have cards like this for every matchup. You're like, oh, you're playing a deck with big bodies? Here's three Deadly Draugers and three Fighters Guild Recruits. By the right. way, one of them's Prophecy, and he just came out when you hit me, and I'm going to kill you with him next turn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, uh, you know, I think that... Part of the success for Scout on the ladder this week has been the fact that Archer is everywhere and um, S Scout's ability to play the aggressor in the Archer matchup has uh, given it a huge edge there. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's a really interesting deck that it can go sort of fast early and then close hard late. Um, yeah. Are there any of these really expensive cards that you think like, okay, it's great, but mm -hmm. it's not necessary. Like, you could still play Scout without some of these expensive cards. I'm, I'm kind of guessing Ungulum the Listener is one of those, where he's just a great card, but he's not utterly critical to what this deck is trying to do. Another two-drop in its place, or maybe a one-drop, could function. Yeah, absolutely. Ungulum's a great example of this. Uh, nine times out of ten, Ungulum, Ungulum the Listener is going to be a mud crab that costs you <clears throat> a week of grinding on the ladder, you know? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I uh, I wouldn't recommend crafting Ungolum the Listener to put in any deck. I think if you open one in a pack that you get through Arena or through a reward, um, congratulations, you should throw this in a lot of your decks. But uh, it's a great example of a card that is just sort of like gravy. I think it helps the Archer matchup where you're likely to get to a point where you're drawing several cards. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps against the Control matchup where you're likely to get to that point. Uh, the other card I would say is least important is uh, a card that actually wins me a lot of games, but the Iron Atronach. I hate how you say that. You're like, this card isn't that relevant. It just wins a lot of games. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, is those were games that it was probably likely to go on for several more turns, but then I would have won, you know? Gotcha. Um, Iron Atronach almost just has the ability to summon your opponent concedes the game, right? right. Because it's a 12 Magicka guy that re has regenerate and breakthrough and guard and can't be targeted by your opponent's actions. Um, and games where you throw this guy down are games that you're looking to lock up, right? right. Uh, worst case scenario is something involving a silence and another effect. You're going to end up getting a 2 or 3 or 4 for 1 with the Iron Atronach every time. However, a lot of games end before you're even going to be able to cast the Iron Atronach. So it's more important, I think, to play the deck in a way that allows you to uh, win earlier than it is to depend on this one copy of a 12-cost card. Okay. What about something like um, Black Marsh Warden that doesn't have like the super splashy effect um, and it's legendary? Do you think it's possible um, to get away with not playing a card like this? Like For instance, for myself, I don't even own this card, and it's not yeah. something I'm eager to be crafting. Um, the Black Marsh Warden is an interesting one. You're right, it's it's really not a splashy card. Um, I think right now it's a reasonable craft for a lot of players who are looking to build multiple uh, ladder decks because it fits into the Spell Sword Token deck as well. Mm. But, you know, there are certainly budget choices that could go into this spot and perform pretty well. Um, you know, there are, there are versions of this deck that run a little heavier on the purple creatures that in that spot wouldn't mind running a Gloom uh, Wraith. That's mm. the uh, four Magicka guy with Breakthrough that gets a bonus for every purple creature you control. Interesting. Okay. Um, the uh, the Archain or something like that Venom Tongue creature, the one four with Lethal. Sure. Um, I took the, that out of the deck. It was in there for a long time. I took it out because it's poor in the Archer matchup. But as Archer declines in popularity because of the rise of counter decks, um, that's not a bad card to put in that spot again. And it's poor in the Archer deck because you're you're purposely running into something, taking a little damage, and then they just play finish off and kill him. Uh, that's part of it. They also run um, Murkwater Witches and Murkwater Shaman to give it minus one, minus one. Which... Oh, jeez. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's even worse. Right. 
It means you spent your whole turn doing nothing, basically. How about the imprisoned death lord? Uh, when a creature is summoned, he gets shackled. That just sounds great. You get to pay for for a dude that never does anything. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that is a great feeling, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really tremendous. I'm sure that in the future there will be a deck that silences that creature for its own benefit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That'll, that'll be uh, an interesting build for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so let's see. Let's talk about some of the other really um, expensive cards in here. So Nagalib seems really important because you're going to hit him early enough to where him being immune to actions is probably going to be really strong. You know, absolutely. Um, the deck's worst matchup is against uh, Control Mage. Um, and so... Th- um, that's part of the reason I put Control Mage up in Tier 1 is that the more popular Scout becomes, the more naturally, I assume, the more popular Control Mage is going to become <clears throat> because it's got a pretty good matchup. I mean, my win rate against Control Mage is above, let's see, I mean, I've written down somewhere. It's above 60% right now, hmm. but, I mean, it's above 90% for everything else, right? Oh, okay, right, yeah. Um, and uh, as the guy who's designed this deck and has been playing it the longest, I think I have a little bit of an advantage at this point. But in the future, as people get more familiar with Control Mage, I think it's going to beat Scout deck pretty regularly. And I think that uh, having cards like Nahogleave, or however you want to pronounce that, I have no idea how these lore cards work, and Iron Age Knock are really important in that match because they're depending on targeting your creatures to removal with spells, excluding their Maroc and Manticoras. Which, you know, as long as you're running as many untargetable by spells creatures as they're running uh, Manticoras, yeah. you know, you're at parity, which is the best you can hope for. I have three Manticoras, but I will say this. If you have Nagalib and you curve him out, let's say, with the Elixir on turn six, yeah. it is a long time before I get to Manticora, that guy. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I could Magic Elixir turn one out a Thieves Guild recruit and draw Nagalib, and then... Turn two, ramp, turn three, ramp, and then turn four, I think I can drop Nahoglyph. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. And then Control Mage can't deal with that. Like, Control yeah. Mage always says, like, oh, I'll just play Manticora. Well, not. No, you won't. You're going to be dead by the time that happens. Right. You know, I think it's a pretty useful card to craft, too, because there's a place for it in a lot of purple decks. Um, yeah. You know, it's just a solid creature. Yeah. Curving out at seven is a lot different than curving out at 12. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd say uh, Taz the Packmaster is another card that I think people should probably just make. Like, he's he's great in an archer deck. He's just amazing. Any card that... So so this is why Taz is so great, in my opinion. If you're going to play an 8-drop, it needs to do something when it comes in. This yeah. does. It's doing damage when it comes in. It also has the last gap, so it's doing something on the way out. If you do something on the way in and the way out, you are one of the best cards in the game, period. I totally agree, and that's my philosophy on expensive cards, too. I much prefer summon abilities to uh, static abilities. Um, and Tazcat, I mean, like, I just... So, you know, Team Prophecy is doing an, a, a tournament amongst ourselves right now. I One of my decks I brought is a Goblins deck. Uh, the deck Ooh. curves out at four, except I'm also running Tazcat. <laughs> wow, you're running a Goblins deck. See, this is secret info. I, I won my first round, so... Well, so did I. Well, I don't know if we're paired next. If we are, I'm going to be thinking. I can't tech my deck because it's already chosen, <laughs> but I'm going to be thinking about that matchup. Like, how the heck do I beat Goblins? I don't even know what a Goblin deck looks like. So Right? <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be very interesting. But yeah, I love Taz. I haven't made him yet, but he's pretty much the next guy I'm going to make. Like, if I decide to make a terrible budget version of scout he will be the first card if i go back to archer at all he'll be the first card i build i think he's just a really solid card i agree not even a meta card just he'll always be good as long as green is playable i agree um any other cards in here that we want to talk about what about the blood magic lords you're gonna get one for leveling do Mm. you really need the second one or do you think you can kind of get away without him i mean i know he's fantastic um it is one of the uh kind of card advantage engines that you're looking to get moving in the late game against some slower decks uh, where you're more interested in drawing cards with him by trading into his, your opponent's creatures than you are in just pushing face damage. But you're right. It's worth pointing out to everybody that at level 50 you uh, you can get yourself a free blood magic lord. And 
in that spot, it's not, you know, if you're working on a budget, it's not like you're going to lose a whole lot of games because you're running some other enormous creature in that spot. Gotcha. The, uh, the blood magic spells that you're going to get from him and the way you're going to use them are going to be sort of next level kind of game playing against really high end opponents. So if you're not at the end of the ladder right now and you're trying to just work up the, uh, the ranks to get legend, uh, don't sweat not having blood magic lord at all or having a second one for that matter. Let's say you're me and you have three bone colossus. Right. Do you think you could shoehorn him into this deck? It, it feels like he doesn't fit that well because without anything to buff the tokens, it doesn't seem quite as destructive as it often is. Um, you know, I don't think it's as good in this deck as it is in the tokens deck, that's for sure. I have experimented with it a little bit and found it to be useful, but my personal play style and the way I've kind of adapted the rest of the list kind of focuses on these, uh, you know, between 5-5 five, five and 6-6 six, six creatures. Uh, sure. Smashing face one at a time, right? Sort of a piecemeal approach to winning. I can definitely see an argument being made for running Bone Colossus in the more aggressive version we were talking about that would run Gloomwraith. Okay. Um, last question then about the list is, do you think it would be more important to craft the epics, the... Thorn, Hist Mage, the Preserver of the Root, the Leaf Lurkers, the Shadowfen Priest, then it would be to craft the bombs. Like, it would be more effective to craft those guys and then just use whatever bombs you have, whether it be Bone Colossus, maybe even something as lame as a Swamp Leviathan, or mm. are these bombs so critical that they're actually more important than the epics? Um, I think that, for the most part, uh, the epics are the best place to to start, and I would personally, I would start with Shadowfin Priest because this card is something that I would run in almost any deck running purple, and it's uh, it's going to single handedly turn games around for you. Okay, and if if you had to say there's one um, legendary that you just have to have, I'm sorry if you're going to make this deck, you have to make this. Is there one, or are they all kind of interchangeable? Um, not there's not really one that single handedly makes the deck work the way it does. Um, I think uh, if you only have the if you only have the soul shards for one, I would craft Tazcad. Okay. Um, the real last question now. Yeah. Is there any cards, card or cards in the deck that you think you're still working on, or do you think this is the list at least as how the meta stands today? Uh, I think the deck definitely has room for improvement. I think His Speaker is a pretty terrible card, actually. And I've been uh, looking into some replacement cards for that. Um, I went, I've gone back and forth with it and uh, Varanus Courier since I started building this deck a couple months ago. Um, right now, I'm looking at the His Speaker because I wanted uh, to maximize my potential for aggressive starts. Mm -hmm. But there's uh, definitely room for improvement there. And I expect that something else will be in that spot in the upcoming weeks. I've got an idea for you. I yeah. just came up with it as we were talking. That's up. What about a move card? What about, like, Doomstalker? Hmm. That could really give some additional value to my Deadly Draugers, couldn't it? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've got a two-drop. It actually does three damage instead of two. The mm -hmm. two the two health is going to die anyway. Right. Um, it lets you move your lethal guys. It lets you move your big bodies later, even, uh to put more pressure on to close easier if they stick a guard in front of them. I don't know. It feels like maybe there's something there. Plus, Justin, no one plays yeah. move. No one's going to play around move. That is so true. Every time it happens to me, I just kind of like I laugh like, well, I should have I should have thought about that, but I mean, I didn't. I feel like it's the best mechanic in the game that no one pays any attention to. I totally agree. I, I don't it's... understand it. Like, I don't either. I don't. I don't play it or pay attention to it. And like you said, whenever it happens, especially when it happens in draft, you're like, oh, dang, that wrecked me so hard. Why don't right. I do that more? Yeah, it, those are super underplayed cards, and um, I think I'll give that a shot. I appreciate the suggestion. Thank you. Boom, look at that. That's fast thinking on, on the fly. That's right. All right, uh, let's talk last thing. Uh, there was a tournament this weekend. I like to talk about the major tournaments. There's the Tamriel mm -hmm. Summer Games that's going on. Uh, there's going to be a number of these events. Um but Team Prophecy uh, kind of took it on the chin in this one. Um, I'll talk about me real quick. Going into the event, like three days before, I assumed it was a bring a deck kind of scenario. And I have one deck. I have my Spell Sword deck. 
And then I was I was informed, well, it's it's a best of three conquest style. You need two decks, and I was like, I need what? <laughs> like, I don't have two <laughs> decks, dude. I'm free to play. What do you mean two decks? Yeah. So I brought a terrible archer deck in, and uh, not surprisingly, my spell sword deck won handily, and then the archer deck lost uh, two games in a row. Um, that was. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I do want to say this though. I beat a guy with a spell sword deck. Turn four, he went elixir. Marshall into Marshall into another card, uh, and I beat him, and he was stunned. <laughs> so wow. That was fun. Nicely done. Yeah, I was, I was pretty happy about that. And then he, we were in Discord chat. He's like, I'm really sorry. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, it's cool, man. This happens, right? Like, I thought I was going to lose too. And then it just kind of, you know, spell sorted it, and did what that deck does, and came back and beat him. Right. That was really fun. So how did you, you know, do, I, Justin? I had a similar experience to you. I brought a deck I was really comfortable with and that I won with, Scout. And then I brought Archer, and I lost with Archer. Um, I think a lot of us on the team actually had the same you know, thing happen to us where we brought our go-to deck that we had been working on for a while and then brought Archer. Yep. And we faced a meta that had already responded to Archer and it brought anti-Archer decks. Yep. And uh, so I was knocked out the first la- round by Size Matters HS. Um who I chatted with after the game, and it was very cordial, and it uh, seems like a really great player. And, um, yeah, it was it was a rout, really. I mean, a fade, I think, from our team made it to the semifinals or something like that? Uh, I think he made it to the Elite Eight. The Elite Eight? Okay. Yeah. And uh, the rest of us were out pretty quickly, so... Yeah. Yeah. It was a good motivator for me to realize that you know, I need to really have two decks, and it's inspired us. Since you already talked about it, I thought it might be a secret. I didn't know. It's inspired us within our team to say, let's replicate this format, and let's be ready, and let's really work on it. And I think that's a really good strategy for everyone, that if you want to be competitive in the tournament scene, you can't just like find a deck that wins on ladder and use it. You need to be ready for the tournament scene, whatever it's going to be. And I talked to the organizer, and he said this is going how it's going to be in the future. So just so you're aware, for anyone who listens, you need to have two decks. It's conquest style, which means both deck has to win. And more interestingly, before you play your opponent, you have to send them your list, which right. is really weird to me because it sort of takes away like secret crazy tech. But I love that. I just mm-hmm. stare at their list the whole time I'm playing, and I'm like, let's Same see, here. do I want to play this? Well, he does have this, which I wasn't expecting, which would kind of blow me out. And I just use their list. It's like on my screen, on the board. <laughs> so, Absolutely. So it's been interesting. Um, you said your opponent was a good person. I played Dimsy Dams. I hate Dimsy Dams. That guy was <laughs> terrible. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. He beat me, so it makes it makes me hate him. But he, he was a yeah. nice guy. <laughs> yeah, no, my opponent was really uh, it has been great to chat with afterwards. Um, and I, I appreciate the opportunity that this gave me then to meet uh, another player yeah and one of my favorite parts about this event is that um the people in the finals are two people i had not heard of before this uh mahaxel 27 and kmar uh the finals has been recorded it's going to be streamed soon um i may actually be casting it and it'll be really fun to see a name come out of this event that at least i hadn't heard of before is going to be a major name in this game they won a big event uh, yeah, so abs- it should be a lot absolutely. Of fun. The you know the upsets early of uh, you know a lot of us who who have started establishing names for ourselves in the community being knocked out really provided an opportunity for a lot of other people to get their names out there, and I think that that kind of expansion is great for the game. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Hopefully, these guys then become streamers and content providers, and and uh, mm-hmm. and really really move the game forward. So, looking totally forward to see where this game goes. Yeah. Uh, you know, keep an eye out for the tournament scene. Come join the Discord channel, which is a great place to find out all this information. Um, so uh, it was a lot of fun. Even though I lost in the first round, still enjoyed it, um, sort of. I have a hard time enjoying things when I'm losing. <laughs> I feel the same way. <laughs> so, Justin, <laughs> where can people find you and your content? Because I've noticed you have gone from, like, one of the top players, if not the top player in the game, who just kind of hangs out in your own space to being like, I am taking over the Internet. So let us know what you're up to. I appreciate that. Um, you know, my girlfriend has supported me and helped me figure out how to use sites like YouTube and Twitter, and uh, we're figuring out Twitch. So we've really put some content out there this last week. 
I can be found on YouTube. My channel is the Justin Larson because uh, it's a pretty common name, so I had to differentiate it somehow. <laughs> well, no, it makes sense. You aren't Justin Larson. You're the Justin Larson. That's right. I get it. I can be found on uh, Twitter under the same thing, the Justin Larson, that I can be found under on YouTube. And I'm posting a few videos a day of me playing Scout, and I've started doing ones of me playing Arena. And finally, I am writing a weekly column on legendsdex.com where I talk about deck building. Excellent. Yeah. All right, that should be a lot of fun. And where are you on Twitch? Uh, we'll get to that. I'm still <laughs> figuring out how to make Twitch work. I uh, Yeah, but you can get a bunch of followers before you're, you're even going. I could do that, yeah. Okay. I am... It's a secret. Is it a secret name for now? I mean, it's the Justin Larson. Okay. So it's, it's not, so it's not secretive at all. It's the exact same name. Okay. No, it's just not. Uh, I'm it's not such a right. luddite that it's taken me a while to That's get fine. my ass into the 21st yeah, century. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell for anyone out there who is thinking about getting into streaming and you have kind of a rocky start. I was terrible when I started. First of all, I didn't know what I was doing. I still really don't. I just went online, copied all the quote correct. Um, settings and just put them in OBS and whenever something goes wrong I'm like oh god I don't actually know what I'm doing here um, so don't be intimidated by that just go online find it out you'll have some rocky moments and we, we all have been there don't worry about it that's how, how it begins no I appreciate that thank you <laughs> um, as for myself you can find me uh, every 12pm to 4pm Monday through Friday on my stream at uh, Twitch TV Tiny Grimes. I have a YouTube channel which has some ridiculous symbols as the name of it, so I'll link it, and it's just just look for Tiny Grimes stuff on YouTube. You'll find it. Uh, my Twitch is Tiny Grimes, or Tiny Grimes Games. I think it's Tiny Grimes. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm around doing stuff, the podcast. Hopefully you found that since you are listening to it, uh, but it's The Secrets of the Scrolls. So I uh, hope you guys had a good time. I know I did. Thanks so much for stopping by, Justin. This was a great show. Thanks for having me. I look forward to hearing more. All right. We'll see you next time on The Secrets of the Scrolls. <laughs>